Hey everyone, welcome to Simming History, where we look at the history of architecture through the lens of the Sims. This is the first episode in what is, will hopefully be an ongoing series in the role of women in architecture. And on today's episode, we're going to take a look at someone who may or may not have been the first recorded female architect, Lady Elizabeth Wilbraham. So first off, I want to say welcome to our new subscribers. Welcome to the Archie family. Thank you for joining us. While we're discussing Lady Elizabeth Wilbraham today, I'm going to be building the family seat of Weston Park. And that's because it serves as a center question on to whether she was, in fact, the first female architect. So Weston Park today looks nothing like Weston Park of the 1600s. Uh, originally, it was a U-shape, like you see me building. But in the 19th century, the center space created in that U was actually completely infilled and a bunch of other buildings were added on to it. So unfortunately, if you go today, it's not going to look anything like the original building. And in fact, only two of the elevations are original, and that is the south and east elevation, which are the only two elevations I'm going to be building today. I'm not really interested in trying to speculate what the other elevations may have looked like. That's not really my job. My job is to talk about the original building and its history. We try not to speculate in my field, but of course we're going to speculate later, so there'll be plenty of time for that. So let's talk about first what do we know. So Lady Elizabeth Wilbraham was born in 1632 and died in 1705. She was a well-known patron of art and architecture. She actually had a copy of Andrea Palladio's Four Books of Architecture in, in Weston Park's library. Like, it's still there today. You can go see it. And it contains her notes on style and construction methods. Now, I think that's really quite key to the question if she was the first female architect. I mean, how many people do you know that has a book containing their personal notes on style and construction methods. I mean, if you ask my friends and family, they would say, well, just one, Sarah, but not everyone has an architect in their social circle. So I think that's a really telling feature that she had this personal book containing her notes on construction methods. Who does that? Besides me, I mean. We also know for a fact that she knew Christopher Wren prior to him leaving his original career. Now, Christopher Wren is this really well-known British architect. He was sort of regarded as almost an architectural genius. And, but prior to being an architect, he was actually in like the science or medical career. And he was there for, I think, over a decade until one day he just up and goes on what they called the world tour, or the great tour, which is really just a tour of classical Europe and then came back and got a commission to build 52 churches in London uh, after the Great London Fire burned all the other churches down. And in fact, his 52 churches, their spires, defined the London skyline for so long, up until the bombings of World War II, that it was actually called Wren's London. And whether you know it or not, you are familiar with his work, because his Pieta, his masterpiece, is none other than St. Paul's Cathedral in London, as in, feed a bird, tuppence a bag. So you know him. You just may not have realized it. We also know for certain that it would not have been acceptable during this time frame for a woman to be an architect. And it certainly would not have been acceptable for a woman of Lady Elizabeth's status to be in any career whatsoever. So she was, in fact, a designer she would have needed what was called an executor. Basically, here's my design. Go build it, sir. Because executors were, of course, always men. So right now on the south elevation, you see me putting on coins, which were these alternating sized stones, um, which the whole purpose of that is to help define bays and make the corner appear differently than the rest of the brick house. Coins spelled Q-U-O-I-N-S, rather than the stuff in your, in the money in your pocket. In the base it's defining, there were five of them on the south 
elevation. There's the far left bay and the far right bay, each having two windows. The center left and the center right bay, each having three windows. And then the center bay, having one window. You also would have seen me put um, what's called a segmental pediment on the top of the left and right bay. That's that rounded pediment that's got that broken cornice beneath it. Broken because it doesn't continue all the way through, but only comes in a bit and then stops. You also notice that there are progressively smaller windows as we go up the building. So the first floor, the most formal floor, would have had larger windows, and the floor above it would have slightly smaller, and so on. So the other things we know are about Western Park, and this is quite slim. So really the only thing we know about this house is it was built in 1671, and that's, that's it. We don't know much. We don't know who the designer was officially. Two designers have been proposed. First, uh, by Historic England, which is a government body. They list Lady Elizabeth Wilbraham as a possible designer. And the second, proposed by the Western Park Foundation, who operates the house today, they propose William Taylor which he was an architect who did work in the area, specifically the Holy Trinity Church in Ministerly, which they cite as having similar features. More on that later. He's also known to have been in the area at the time and to have visited Western Park in 1674 after the house was built. That's it. That's all we know about Western Park, which means it's time to wander into that speculation I was talking about. So first, we're going to talk about a historian who's doing his own speculation. His name's John Mylar. He is currently writing a book, uh, at least as of 2012, and I really hope he's still working on it because it sounds fascinating. In his book, he's going to propose that Lady Elizabeth Wilbraham was actually responsible for up to 400 buildings. That's a lot. So if she's actually responsible for that many, that's, that's an impressive portfolio for any architect. And here's his biggest hot take. He is proposing that she is responsible for 18 of Wren's 52 London churches, saying that those 18 share details that are not found in any of the others. And when he proposed this idea, to a Wren scholar, the Wren scholar basically didn't buy it, and the main reason given was simply he had never heard of it before. We're learning new things about history every day, and especially in instances like this, where there is going to be little, if any, records, if there can be evidence found, then I think people should approach that evidence with an open mind as long as there is evidence that can be found. I mean, the reality is we're never going to know for certain, but if he can make a good, strong case, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be at least considered. John Mylar also proposes that Elizabeth Wilbraham trained Christopher Wren, which may explain those 18 of those 52 churches. It may also explain that really abrupt career change from basically the science field into architecture. Architecture is not really a self-taught field. <laughs> and it would make sense if Christopher Wren had a mentor who guided him towards treatises to read or buildings to study or good construction methods. And whether that person was Lady Elizabeth Wilbraham, I can't say. But I would think there needs there, there should be a mentor out there somewhere. So I'm really hoping John Myler's book comes out soon, because I'm very interested to see the case that he makes. And unfortunately, I really can't analyze it much farther, because I don't know what 400 buildings he's referencing. And he has only mentioned, I think, one or two of the 18 churches. So and none of the details that supposedly connect them all. So I'm very interested to hear what he has to say and what proof he's found and see whether or not that will actually change anything. So hopefully there'll be an update to this in the future, fingers crossed. 
So right now, you'll see on screen, I'm building the east elevation, and I'm adding more of those coins. Um, if I haven't said this already, they were an absolute pain. So many, so many. This build took a very long time. It's really primarily because of those coins. The east elevation was turned into the entry uh, in the 19th century from the south elevation. So they added a what's called a porte cochere to the east elevation. It's basically a covered area for the carriages and later cars to drive under so you could disembark without getting wet in the rain. And that porte cochere is still there today. I did not build it on this building because it was not original. Uh, you'll see this elevation is separated into three bays and it's a pattern called 333 three, three, because there's three windows on the left hand side, three in the center, and three on the right. So the center bay in reality is also slightly projected just like the center and the right and left bays on the south end. Unfortunately Sims really doesn't let you slightly project anything. And also up above, you'll see there in that, that triangular pediment in the center, there's something called a cartouche. A cartouche is basically like a stone family seal or crest. Sims unfortunately really didn't have a stone family seal or crest, so it just sort of had to make do. So finally we're going to try to answer the real question here. Who designed Weston Park? To do that, we're really only going to look at the two proposed designers, Lady Elizabeth Wilbraham, as proposed by Historic England, and William Taylor, as proposed by the Weston Park Foundation. Now, without John Mylar's published book, I really don't have any other works to compare Weston Park to for Lady Elizabeth Wilbraham. There's no acknowledged portfolio. So really, the question for us today is going to come down to, did William Taylor design Weston Park? And since Weston Park Foundation cites very specifically the Holy Trinity Church at Minsterly, we're going to look at that church and see just how similar or not similar it is to Weston Park in an attempt to answer that question. So to look at these two buildings, we're actually going to use a picture of the actual church at Minsterly, which we don't really do a lot here. So this, pic this picture of the church at Minsterly is provided by a license from Creative Commons. Required citation is down below. So upon first glance, these two buildings look kind of similar. They're both brick, they both have stonework, they both have a rounded pediment. For me, the question really comes down to proportion and quality of detailing. So when you look at Weston Park, the windows have a formal order. Levels are clearly defined. When you look at Ministerly Church, levels are less clearly defined and there really is no formal order. The, two, the four windows, two on each side, are significantly smaller and out of proportion to that center feature. At Weston Park, we have those corner stone coins that define each bay, where at Minnesota Church we don't have that. Instead we just kind of have these large clunky stone pilasters that are pulled in from the corner and supporting that rounded pediment. Now rounded pediment at Weston Park it's an actual true rounded pediment with a broken cornice in the bottom. At Minnesota Church it's actually in the same plane as that brick parapet wall behind it and so the pediment is only really created by the trim, the stone trim. And so it's not really a true full rounded pediment. And what's more is it's interrupted by that center feature, that massive door and window and clock. that's all been just sort of jammed together and jammed into this elevation. And it's interrupting or penetrating the bottom of that pediment. And that's that interruption is a detail that we just don't see in classical architecture. I mean, you will occasionally, but it's it's not common. It sort of breaks the rules. Like at Weston Park, you don't see that. There's Everything stays on its level. The pediments are not interrupted or penetrated. They're, they have their own features, whether it's the windows or it's the cartouche. They're their own things. They're their own elements. 
So, the, to me, the detailing at Western Park is far more delicate and finesse than the detailing at Ministerly Church. Now, that doesn't mean they weren't drawn by the same hand. An architect's skill with details develops and changes over time. The issue I have is Ministerly Church was built over a decade after Weston Park. And generally, one's expertise of detailing does not decrease with time. And if these had been designed by the same person, I would have actually expected Ministerly Church to be the older building, to have been built earlier than Weston Park, and that's not the case. For me, the church at Ministerly is not a great argument for William Taylor being the architect. I actually very much struggle to see this being done by the same hand. He may have very well been influenced by Weston Park. He did visit Weston Park prior to designing the Holy Trinity Church. So that could be um, an explanation for some of the shared details. But I, I just am not seeing him being the designer of Weston Park. Now, that doesn't mean a Lady Elizabeth Wilbraham is. Which leaves us really at the end of the video with just a lot of questions. We just simply don't know. And hopefully, if Lady Elizabeth Wilbraham was indeed the first lady of architecture, which I'm kind of hoping she was, I very much like her as a character uh, and as a person in history, um, hopefully we'll have an answer to some of these questions someday. And hopefully that will mean a follow-up video. You can find me on Sims 4 Gallery on Instagram at Simming History, where I post teasers for next week's video. Make sure to hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next week.